Thank you, Angela, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Andres Martinez. I teach journalism at our Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University, and I am the editorial director of Future Tense, which is a project of New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. And I'm thrilled to be here today with uh, my good friend and former boss, uh, Steve Call, who uh, is the dean of the country's second uh, best journalism school. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> come on. And, um, but also uh, significantly, he is one of the founding fathers of uh, a future tense. That's, Steve has many accomplishments, but we, we like to think that, that that ranks high up there. He is, of course, a former president of New America, former managing editor of the Washington Post, author of, of many great books. And so, uh, Steve, really appreciate your taking the time today. I know, you, I know you're very busy. Um, well, thank you, Andres. Thank you for having me back to New America. I always enjoy that, uh, even virtually. And thanks to the uh, group who's with us for sharing some of their confinement uh, with us. That's my wife, oh, Eliza Griswold. Yes. That's Andres awesome. Martinez in the middle of a live webinar. Excuse me. Okay. I just so <laughs> All right. Another um, great writer and a great mind, and she should pull up a, a chair. Yes. Um, okay. So, you know, I can't imagine. I, uh, I don't know if checking in with you is going to make me more uh, alarmed or make me feel better, a little bit better about the, the state of affairs around the world. But um, I can't think of a, of a more authoritative person to check in with about this sort of uh, parallel epidemic that uh, a lot of people have taken note of and are concerned about that we're seeing globally when it comes to free speech. And I, and I should I should have mentioned that this is the latest in a, in a long series of conversations that we're having that we have, we're calling the Free Speech Project. It's, it's, we're doing this in collaboration um, with American University's uh, Tech Law and Security Program. So I, I should have mentioned that. So we, we were concerned about uh, the state of free speech well before the pandemic, as, as a lot of other people are in our, in our field. Um, and along comes this moment. And as we see with other crises, um, you know, particularly in the context of wartime, governments that tend to have uh, authoritarian tendencies to begin with often take advantage of these uh, moments to uh, uh, act against critics, dissent, uh, control speech. And of course, the, the, the thing about this pandemic and this crisis is I, I, I can't think of anything else in my lifetime that is so universal in its reach, right? It's not a regional issue. It's not, you know, two or three countries over here involved in, in conflict or facing civil disturbance. It's 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 global and it comes at a time when we we hit when we had seen sort of a rise in in, in authoritarianism um, and uh, some devaluation in appreciation for some fundamental civil rights and 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 also kind of a return of, of nationalistic sovereign concerns that say what happens in my borders I can control. But so just those are just some, some initial observations that I have. And, and, and I wonder, though, if you feel that there is something materially different about the, the attack on free speech that we're seeing. And I mean, you can pick your country, right? Iran, Venezuela, Egypt, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Hungary. There's been a lot of um, uh, you know, reporting to the extent that, that it's possible on what's, what's happening in a lot of these countries. Is it, is it materially different to uh, <clears throat> reactions against speech in the past or in <clears throat> how would you describe what's, what's going on? Well, I mean, we're kind of living through the end of globalization as we knew it in the period between the end of the Cold War and Pick your, pick your date of decline, but sometime uh, in the aftermath of the last financial crisis. So yes, there's a, gen there's a general kind of tightening, a return to authoritarian governments that are unabashed and that don't feel a need to, um, to even create the appearance of a regime of free speech and free press in order to have credibility with the international system. So if you think about um, 
the repression of speech and journalism worldwide, it has clearly been rising steadily over the last few years. And as more and more governments of different stripes uh, succeed in uh, repressing, jailing journalists uh, with relative impunity in the international system, the more others are encouraged to follow. And so you have regimes like Turkey and Egypt that have imprisoned um, more journalists than ever. Uh, they've been able to get away with rationalizations of national security that would have been um, tested and, and even sanctioned in the past. But then you also have a rhetorical environment of polarization, um, populism, and attacks on the credibility of independent journalism uh, that are certainly um, rising. Uh, we have a president who makes a daily sport of it, but uh, you know he his his embrace of that language of populism and his direct attacks on on journalists as part of a conspiracy against uh, himself and his followers. Uh, is being picked up and and right. uh, echoed as a strategy, or he's or he's adapting the strategies of of the Dutertes and the Modis of the world. You know, I think the one thing, if you, since your your conversations are are centered around speech as opposed to journalism, because I think they are related but distinct, um, we are also experiencing a world of speech in which there's a even as there's a closing of uh, governmental policy attitudes repression in diverse parts of the world, including members of the, o of the European Union, like Hungary, and uh, in the United States, uh, at least through political speech. At the same time, you have this huge structural opening of speech through uh, the spread of social media platforms and, and bottom-up communication that governments attempt to suppress with mixed results. Um, they're getting better at it, um, but you still have this competition going on. Uh, you know, when Egypt decides to uh, control political speech in that uh, very large and politically aware nation, um, you say, what's different? It's not like the 1950s when they could control the radio station and the TV station and then what was left were the cafes and the word on the street and maybe some underground political organizing and unions and lawyers guilds and that sort of thing where speech could be um, organized in defiance of the government's regime. Now, instead of a handful of unions and lawyers guilds, you've got all of the population potentially with access to global uh, speech. And so, you know, you have this Egyptian exile dissenter, I think he's in Spain, uh, you know, writing uh, things that would result in his immediate arrest and prosecution if he were at home, and it matters. So there is a competition between this uh, new era of authoritarianism, I think, and the structure of open speech that, that technology and connectivity have created. Yeah, and I, I feel like 10 years ago when we were working together in New America, that structural opening uh, was the cause of great um, optimism and, and, and you know, uh, there was a lot of euphoria about, you know, the Arab Spring and, and all the ways in which the, our, our newfound connectivity and, and how empowering these platforms were, were going to be. And then uh, we sort of soured on that. And then in the last more recent years, we've been very concerned about how these platforms can be weaponized in ways that are uh, pernicious and disinformation campaigns and so forth. And so one, one thing that's been interesting to see in this moment of the pandemic is governments sort of cynically perhaps saying, okay, well, yes, uh, we keep hearing the misinformation and disinformation is, is a, is a, uh, a, a source of grave concern, you know, even in, even in, uh, in democracies. And so I know we'll just outlaw it, right? So this, this has been sort of a trend where countries will uh, outlaw misinformation, which, you know, they can conveniently be the judges of what constitutes misinformation. Um, so it's been interesting to see that, that shift. We had a good piece uh, in the last week about the, uh, the in Vietnam that, the outlawing of misinformation. Uh, you know, if only it were that easy, right? Hmm. 
Well, in this country too, it's interesting. I mean, um, Facebook obviously has been the, the focal point of uh, re reconsideration of this kind of privately owned public square that uh, Facebook in particular operates, but you could say the same of YouTube and, and some other important platforms, but Facebook uh, most dominant and most uh, susceptible, the evidence shows, to uh, deliberate campaigns of misinformation and political manipulation, um, even today. Uh, problematical because uh, its, its public square is closed to researchers who even want to document what's going on. And Facebook now is gradually, you know, year by year, month by month, attempting to get ahead of the prospect of regulation or other governmental action in the United States, which it's already facing in Europe and, and elsewhere, to get ahead of that by attempting to self-regulate and to um, use both technology and now this new panel of overseers, of experts, uh, to try to get a grip on what is permissible speech, even if it's inaccurate speech, and what is uh, unacceptable propaganda or manipulation or misinformation. Right. And you know, the net result of it is you have to, I think, even if you are one of those people, as I am, who is um, appalled by the pollution that Facebook allows across its platform in the, in the name of openness, but in the context of you know, a, a, a program of profit making um, and, and, the, and the lack of responsibility that Facebook has been willing to take for its role as a publisher, its place as a public square. So I'm appalled by that. On the other hand, I, I'm ready to admit that this tightening, this self-regulation is going to have the effect, is already having the effect of uh, making marginal speech less, uh, less possible, less, less influential, less present. Uh, and, you know, okay, if you are the, of the school that thinks Alex Jones uh, and Infowars uh, should not be part of a credible publishing operation, um, you may be pleased by that, but that it's always the case that policies adopted to silence a, a voice that the consensus holds to be unacceptable also turns out to silence lots of other voices uh, right. before they can even get going, <laughs> and uh, which may be necessary uh, to, to our kind of system of continuous uh, self-examination and, and change. So yeah, I think I, I think there's a lot of of that going on. You know, if I can just jump into the sort of darkness subject, though, because there's a lot of darkness in the in these in the discourse about speech and journalism. In you know, as authoritarianism rises around the world and as populism uh, polarizes politics in our country and in other countries. Um, but I just say I. I, I <laughs> I like I, I like probably the kinds of people who are listening to us now. One of my responses to the pandemic was to go back and read *The Plague* by Albert Camus, <laughs> and uh, it's quite it's quite uh, a, a worthwhile, um, if not uplifting, uh, novel to read in these times because it, it his, its prescience for what we're going through is just stunning. But uh, well, or the or actually, what it does is it places what we're going through in the proper accurate eternal context of recurring um, right. epidemics and government responses to them um, and the failure of governments to get a grip on viruses throughout history. But anyway, um, it made me interested in Camus and I'm gonna write something about this for the New Yorker so you'll see it, when it whenever it drops, but it made me interested in him and I was reminded that he joined the resistance in Paris as an editor in 1943 and 1944 against Nazism. And I oh. went back and read his articles in the, in the newspaper he edited, this clandestine newspaper called Combat. And he basically is trying to respond to the German propaganda machine, which, I mean, talk about a dark moment in <laughs> <laughs> and manipulation of public opinion. I mean, he didn't even have Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and his, his, optimism 
<laughs> in these, I mean, he's very forceful and clear. I mean, he really is kind of closer to Orwell in the clarity of his political language than I appreciated um, as close, um, uh, yeah, as, as, you, as I've come across on the continent. But anyway, um, he, he basically just says, you know, facts will win out at the end. The truth will win out, my countrymen. You know, pay no attention to all of these lies. Yes, if you tell a lie a million times, it will have an influence but so will the truth. And so we are going to just stay that course. Now you look back on, on what kind of a person would write that mm -hmm. uh, under false papers, you know, living <laughs> like half a, half a door from the German counterintelligence service that would torture him if they knew what he was doing and, and turn out to be right, you know, turn out to be right. So I don't know. I, I, I hate as a, Friend always says optimism is just a state of brain chemistry, but just when you look at the, the kind of assumption that misinformation, because it's growing, because it's prevalent, will win, I, I think there's reason to, to both moral and analytically, there are reasons to fight against that assumption. I, I like that note of optimism. Uh, it's clouded in my mind by PTSD from having to read that book in a, the, the, it's about as far as I gotten in French when I was studying, I, I had to read La Peste and uh, I still remember the first line about his mother is dead. And it was like nice. the, the verb continue, <laughs> so I'm having some PTSD, but, but yes, fortunately he did write very clearly. So even for a yes. student of, of French, um, I'll have to go back and read that because <laughs> there's also been a lot of reference, referencing to uh, Garcia Marquez and yeah. Love the of cholera. So um, but I, I like that sense of optimism. But but I mean, what you're what you're pointing to when we talk about these platforms, and and going back to your comment that censorship isn't what it used to be in the sense that you don't have, you know, the army surrounding the the radio broadcast station, and 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 that's and basically like the job is done. Even in a lot of these countries that we're referencing, there is a fair amount of openness to uh, you know social media platforms, and so. Who who is the censor is is a different uh, it's a different equation now and 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 these platforms are often in the uh, I mean in the, in the U.S. context the debate has been should they exercise editorial judgment and start thinking of themselves as uh, you know having the role that you used to have at the Washington Post in terms of you know deciding what's credible what's not what's newsworthy et cetera but in a lot of these other countries it's they're kind of often the ones who are asked by the government to take down speech that, you know, uh, ostensibly violates norms that the government has maybe arbitrarily decided, you know, imposed in that country. And they don't, they're, you know, these platforms are sort of caught in between and they're scrambling to figure out, you know, should they stand up to the government? Should they, uh, you know, Google famously pulled out of China back in the day. And um, so that, but just talk a little bit more about that, the evolution of how, I mean, Facebook in particular perceives itself, you know, once upon a time, I think you know, Mark Zuckerberg said like, I, I'm not responsible for anything that is, uh, for any of the content on this platform, I'm just providing the public square or, you know, the other analogies people made is I'm like the phone company. I mean, if people say I've seen things on, you know, when they're connected, that I've connected, that's that's not on AT&T, that's, that's on them. And so, you know, all these analogies were sort of imperfect, but you're right, whether they, they haven't explicitly embraced the fact that they are in this, in the business that you used to be in, in the Washington Post, but there's certainly been an evolution and, and there, ha I mean, just because of the outrage and because of the threat of regulation and whatnot, you know, they've, and I feel like with the pandemic, there's more and more um, uh, vigilance on, on, in terms of the content and then this oversight board, I mean, I, I've, I've heard, I mean, people have a differing views on how effective that's going to be and whether it's just, you know, uh, window dressing or whether it's going to be sort of a, a useful Supreme Court type instrument to at least make some of the tough calls. Um, but do you see do you, do you see things evolving to a point where, uh, you know, Mark's, the, Mark Zuckerberg or his successor at, you know, running Facebook is going to be the sort of uh, feel like they his or her role is the same that, uh, you know, the Graham family when they were stewards of the Washington Post or the Salzburgers at the New York Times, or 
is it just going to be different and we're not going to get to something resembling that? I mean, I think, you know, Facebook is controlled by Mark Zuckerberg, just the way the New York Times company is controlled by the Salzberger family and the Washington Post company was controlled by the Graham family. They, he owns the A share. So it's not a normal publicly traded company in the sense that all of these external pressures that would normally drive a public company towards reforms, um, they meet resistance from their owner, who uh, I don't think will evolve into the outlook that the Salzburgers or the Grams had as newspaper owners. He's, he's, he's too wedded to the, to the insights, I guess, as he would call them, that he developed in creating the platform and to the, the kind of philosophy or ideology that evolved as Facebook scaled. Now he has um, been rethinking uh, some of the regulatory issues as the each time the status quo became untenable, he would think a little bit forward. Uh, the mechanisms that he has used to try to get the governments uh, that influence Facebook's profitability off his back have evolved. Initially, Facebook uh, took the view that a lot of Silicon Valley companies do, which is surely there's an engineering solution for this. We don't need gatekeepers. Uh, that's We've already blown up all the gatekeepers, the newspaper editors, the book editors. They're antiquated, they're unnecessary, they're, they're, their function uh, is inefficient and, and maybe even structurally damaging. And so let's, let's write code and algorithms and, and build kind of crowdsourced insights that will that will produce a better um, experience for our users. And so when, when the problems started arising, like people can, carrying out acts of violence using Facebook Live or staging gruesome events of various kinds that I just skipped past what those all were. Um, well, their first response was to try to write code that would detect these and right. preempt them. That didn't work uh, because the human complexity that you have to manage when you build a beehive of the sort that Facebook um, represents is just too great for all code all the time. And so then they started hiring these uh, sent these kind of editors, as they called them. They turned out to be, for the most part, low paid workers in places like the Philippines in the India and, and southern India who had to you know, work shifts in which they watched just unspeakable material and decided which was on the wrong side of the free speech line that uh, mm -hmm. that Facebook was trying to enforce, which I think was probably not a very healthy working environment for, for many of those people. But anyway, um, also a very retail and not traditional publisher's approach to the question of what content is welcome um, on our on our platform. Now you have this Supreme Court, which is going to attempt to, to try to unify the, the questions about policy and access and so on. And, and there's a notional independence that's being given to this board, but it, it's, its um, function is so circumscribed, at least in the way it's been initially described, that it doesn't, doesn't actually constitute management. It, it's, it's a so it's, it seems like a safety valve for the leadership of the companies to, to basically be able to say, well, that's not our responsibility anymore. So I don't mean to be cynical. I mean, Facebook is a living organism and Mark Zuckerberg has got a long life ahead of him. But when you say Mark Zuckerberg or his successor, I mean, wait 40 <laughs> years if he has a normal lifespan uh, and, and he's not, he doesn't seem in any hurry to turn this over to anyone else. We just had we had a conversation recently with the FEC commissioner Ellen Weintraub. We 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 do these movie nights. I, I, I don't know if you were still here for, and, and got to go to any, but we 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 normally will have a we'll ask somebody interesting to pick a, their favorite movie and we'll show them at the E Street landmark. And uh, of course, we were and we had already scheduled it with her when this situation came along. So, but she picked the social network, and so we still had a, a chat with her about it. Yeah. And so. It was, and uh, I, I watched that with my with my son, who had never seen it. Uh, Sebastian, he's fifteen now, and um, it, you know, watching them high five when they hit the when they get the one million, and <laughs> the uh, 
it was interesting just to rewatch that movie and and uh and it, 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 i'd forgotten how dark it is and i think that movie came out the the period of time between uh, the founding of facebook uh sebastian was also very struck by the fact that he's as old as facebook is they were <laughs> born in the same year in you know that dorm room at, at harvard and but that movie basically came out, I think, it was roughly the midpoint between the founding of Facebook and, and where we are uh, today. So uh, it was kind of interesting. And it also left me wondering, uh, how did the uh, the twins, the Winklevi, <laughs> as Mark Zuckerberg calls them, how are they doing with their Bitcoin investments? Because for a while there, they were like heavily into, into Bitcoin. Um, do you have a view? I mean, I realize this is this is getting a little bit away from this from the sort of German journalism framing. But do you have a view on uh, the sort of debate around political advertising? You know, Facebook has has taken one stance, and there's questions about how much they should be, uh, you know, vetting political ads uh, for veracity. And then Twitter just said, like, this isn't worth it. We're not. We're not. We're getting out of this business. Which, begs all sorts of questions about what is political and not what's not political. And of course, that wasn't a huge business for them to begin with. But do you, despite all of the um, the difficulties of policing these networks and the ways in which their business model might not uh, have the right incentives to act in a responsible way, do you think there's a concern if we just start, you know, throwing our hands up in the air and saying a lot of this is just too hard um, and platforms say, you know, when it comes to public issues, we're just going to say, don't do it here. And of course they have that right. There's not a first amendment issue because they're private enterprises. But so the, I mean, a lot of this could fall into the category of corrective measures, but there's always, you know, sometimes that creates new problems too. I mean, if I'm, a political candidate and want to reach people on Twitter. I can't. Uh, uh, I guess through you know my can't can't have sponsored messaging, and so I mean I can go somewhere else, I suppose. Um, but over time, if if we just if we decide that political advocacy is too hard, do you think that could be a, a dangerous trend too, or? I'm not worried as much about that. Um, I do think, I mean, my own views are shifting maybe a little bit um, toward where some people on the right are about political advertising just in the last year or two, partly based on evidence. But I'll, I, I'll say that, I mean, I think there are some common sense um, laws and goals around political advertising makes sense to me, like whoever's paying for it, we should know who that is. Transparency and one of the problems with the post Citizens United regime is the dark money, which I don't think um, can be justified, especially not in a speech context where you're privileging uh, right. sometimes false political advertising, often false or manipulative political advertising on, on a speech basis, but you, there's no you know, I know anonymous speech is also protected, but anonymous finance speech just seems inconsistent with our political values. That's one uh, line that I would wish to enforce. And then, of course, uh, money that is being poured into the United States to influence an American election from international sources. I don't think uh, the law or our uh, constitution uh, you know, wants to see that become a regular part of our elections. But what I, where I've shifted is, I don't think political advertising as speech is as dangerous as some of our kind of orthodoxy or, or certainly some of the conventional wisdom on the left has held it to be as post Citizens United. I mean, election cycle after election cycle over the last, you know, I don't know, certainly going back to 2008, um, all of these groups, um, outside groups with different uh, agendas have poured amazing amounts of money into races through television and social media political advertising. What's the evidence they have actually influenced outcomes? I mean, if you wanted to run uh, an exam, I mean, if you wanted to run a, um, a test of this hypothesis, 
Well, we just had one. Michael Bloomberg spent, what, $350 million in, I don't know, two months? And all it took was one moment on the debate stage. And it just, you might as well have taken it into the backyard of his, you know, of his home in the Bahamas and set it all on fire for all the good it did. And, you know, so there is a sort of hysteria about political spending that I don't think is justified by evidence of, and it's not just that case. I think there's a fair amount of social science that says, yes, you know, political adver- ads can be influential to some uh, people. People do take a lot of uh, information in about elections on television, and those ads can influence uh, some people. But I don't see the evidence that they are as decisive as, uh, so decisive as to justify the costs in speech to start trying to enforce lines that are very difficult to draw as to what is acceptable advertising and what is not. Yeah. And secondly, you know, if you ask, uh, you know, you don't have to take this from a right perspective or a left perspective. If you ask uh, political professionals on both sides of the competition uh, who are, you know, really fired up about their agenda of winning, including on the left, they don't want these these restrictions either. I mean, I was teaching a covering politics class this spring and I had a woman in who ran, you know, one of the Democratic primary campaigns that was, you know, on the left side of the party spectrum. And she was fascinating when people asked her about um, this. It was at the moment when Facebook was trying to restrict political advertising because of concerns about what was coming from the right. And she said, you know, we don't want to see any of those uh, restrictions imposed because as soon as they go down against Trump, they're going to go down against us. And we think if we can get our message out, we'll win. (laughs) So we we want everyone to get out of the way so we can speak basically. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, I want to remind everybody who's watching to uh, feel free to ask questions. I, I, I want to just sprinkle them into the conversation as opposed to they're coming a time where I'm going to say like, okay, now we're open for questions. So the Q and a function, on Zoom is great for that. Um, Steve, you mentioned earlier the fact that um, you know there's been sort of a breakdown of the of of the international system and and globalization um, in, in in the you know over the past few years, past decade, and so in this moment there aren't you know plenty of uh, uh, governments around the world you know if they're trying to assess the cost benefits of acting in ways that um, might have at one point gotten them gotten them into trouble with um, uh, whoever was policing, you know, whether it's a United Nations committee or sort of the, a scold in Washington or the, or the European Union, it does feel like there's a lot more latitude for countries to decide that the, the reputational cost of acting in ways that are that are um, not the most democratic, that reputational cost is less than it used to be. Um, I sometimes feel that, uh, you know, sitting in the States, we can maybe overstate this because we just feel like everything revolves on the United States. And so if our president's acting badly, everyone else around the world is gonna take their cue from that. Uh, I mean, he does use, as you, as you pointed out, uh, language like, enemy of the people, which in other contexts has very dire repercussions when, you know, leaders in, in other countries just sort of appropriate that language. So I don't mean to minimize that, but sitting where you sit uh, as the Dean of, of the Columbia School of Journalism, do you, <clears throat> have you had conversations with people in other countries that, that do make this very direct linkage of, hey, we, we've been counting on, on you, you know, the United States, and now there's, we have, we, nobody has our back. I mean, do you, do you hear that from people? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I, I, I don't have conversations to recount, but I don't think there's any question that in, um, in the emerging world, particularly in countries like the Philippines that have long historical ties to the United States, the uh, influence of the permission that the president creates when he calls uh, the American professional working press enemies of the people is meaningful. And it is felt on the ground. Maria Ressa, one of the great 
independent journalists in the Philippines uh, came and spoke to our graduates um, last year, I think it was, and I spent time with her and, you know, she is hanging on by her fingernails and every time uh, Trump delegitimizes uh, journalism uh, through his speech or uses in language of incitement to, uh, care, you know, to basically incite attacks on journalists, it washes into a, a place like the Philippines um, in a very meaningful way. I think, you know, to step back from your question, um, the United States has already surrendered leadership in the realm of global human rights promotion or global free speech promotion. So this is not a, a um, you know, this is not a speculative uh, question now. We're in the fourth year of the Trump administration. Um, the European Union has its own problems, but one of the problems it's trying to address is that it can't count on the United States uh, to, right. uh, to, to prioritize uh, not just speech and press freedom, but, um, you know, the, to, to use the instruments of the international system that might influence governments um, uh, in, a, you know, in a way that prioritizes human rights. I, you, can, you can certainly critique the European Union's own ineffectualness um, to live up to its own values, but, um, but it's definitely a world that is, uh, that is um, full of, of sort of a centrifugal force um, around these subjects. I, I mean, when, when you talk about human rights and, and, and the status of the press worldwide, I think you have to connect that to the state of human rights defense generally. I mean, yeah. you know, there's not a difference between the status of the press in Latin America or in uh, Asia or in um, parts of Europe and the general state of human of, of human rights and civil rights. I mean, they they when when governments uh, seek to repress all uh, civil and, and human rights, they also su suppress uh, press independence and and speech. And that's as worrisome as as the conversation we've been having about the actual information ecosystem in which we live, because. Um, I think it's hard for me to remember as an adult of a certain young, youngish boomer age, when in my politically aware lifetime, human rights promotion or defense has been less salient to international kind of power or right. course or the priorities of, of international institutions, including the UN, but also the IMF and the World Bank. and. And and lots of other um, organizations, the big the big foundations, um, open society, which I was involved in for a while, uh, you know, has is back on its heels, kicked out of Budapest, where George Soros created an important university, and so and who's defending who's defending uh, these organizations as they're forced into their retreats? Rarely do their governments put anything on the line, um, in, including the United States government. Right. So here's a question. Um, it's a little, it's, a, it's an interesting shift of gears. As a, as a dean uh, of a journalism school, do you see um, a shift in, uh, between generations in terms of their overall view of free speech. I mean, I, I think um, uh, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of people of a certain age, you know, if you read uh, uh, op-ed columns, there's a lot of hand-wringing about the state of, you know, how political correctness is run amok on, on campuses. And there's very, there's a lot less tolerance for, for, for free speech that's, that's threatening to people or, or not comfortable and, Gosh darn it! We're abandoning our uh, one of the things that was that was essential to American exceptionalism was this high tolerance for obnoxious speech and you know going back to sort of the Brandeisian view of of that right and Supreme Court you know cases that defended the right of you know Nazis to parade down you know Skokie Illinois wherever it was and and that you know there's been a shift where people 
uh, younger people now might might sort of uh, assess the 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 cost of that unfettered free speech that can often be hurtful to people in a different way. Um, but then I also hear a lot of colleagues say that some of that critique is 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 overdone and it's it's not that different. But have you um, you know you're sort of still relatively recent arrival to the world of academia. Um, Seven I mean, years. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel like yesterday. Relatively. <laughs> yeah. Relative, yeah, but I mean, uh, so so, and you're also. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think a journalism school. So you, yeah. presumably you have the, the the true believers, but I don't know. I I, I do notice a slight difference uh, in terms of my students and and how we viewed things uh, a long time ago when I was in college. But but what's your what's your thought on whether we we are seeing a a generational shift? where we draw these lines? Well, I think you said there at the end where I would begin, which is that at a journalism school, um, you know, you're, we find that our students are much, are, are very open to uh, alternate points of view and aren't coming with an orthodox about what's acceptable speech. They're, they want to become journalists. Um, they want uh, to understand how to report, uh, how to think, how to write, and uh, they're at the graduate level, so they are purposeful. And um, we have had, in my time, um, hardly any um, uh, problem with with uh, students not wanting to hear a point of view. Uh, in fact, uh, we are the kind of vanguard at the university for bringing in diverse points of view sometimes. And, and I think our students share the outlook of our faculty that that's, that's what we do. And mm -hmm. I try the biggest deficit, however, in our faculty is conservative, I, political conservative perspectives. And so we try to, I try to bring in people, uh, even from the never Trump uh, conservative uh, press, and, and they feel, uh, trepidation about stepping onto Columbia's <laughs> campus and coming into our, our school. And then everyone, of course, treats them way too politely. And so nothing ever really gets said. But I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, Kyle Pope, who runs Columbia Journalism Review, had an editor from Breitbart come in and, uh, and had him on a panel with, you know, someone from the New York Times and someone else. He was a former Wall Street Journal reporter. And uh, it went reasonably well. Um, but there's not enough of that, uh, th but that's really about defining um, the range of journalism that is actually relevant uh, to uh, to our society. Um, in terms of speech, um, and this like the incident at the University of Missouri where um, reporters were turned away by protesters who basically said, uh, hostily and even were backed by a faculty member uh, who had some dual appointment at the journalism school, you know, you're not allowed to ask questions of these right. protesters because they're in a safe space. Now that, that um, there may be some students who harbor sympathy for those protesters, I'm sure there are, but, but that is not a, a form of activism that, that arises in the classroom or that, or that is trying to reshape journalism. I mean, and then this this year there was the uh, the controversy at Northwestern, right? Um, which was sort of similar. The student newspaper yeah. apologizing. Yeah. For yeah, and I felt badly for that editor who you know who made who made some uh, you know the kinds of judgments that a young a young person without a lot of backup uh, you know can make and and got eviscerated for it. There was no ambiguity among our faculty or students about what was wrong and right there from a journalistic perspective, but there is some sympathy for the, for the peer culture that this generation is shaping for itself of respect, of, of inclusiveness. And I have respect for that as, you know, it, it doesn't need to be hostile to journalism. Uh, right. It can sometimes create unfortunate decision-making as happened in the case of Northwestern, but, Right. But uh, there's, you know, there's nothing innately wrong with trying to redefine from gener generation to generation who's included, who's respected, how are they respected? I mean, every generation that in, in an open society full of social change and change in civil rights 
consciousness and and goal setting goes through that. So I'm I, I don't I don't feel threatened by it. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions that are uh, in a sort of similar vein, and and you mentioned the University of Missouri, so I should hand the microphone to Christopher Leonard, uh, an old friend of yours, a great oh, yeah. journalist, one of our uh, star fellows at New America back in the day. Chris is asking, um, how do you see the unfolding economic crisis affecting free speech, particularly in America? It seems that weakened media outlets might be less likely to challenge powerful government and corporate institutions. And there were a couple of questions that, that had the similar vein of um, the pandemic's impact on, on the actual business of journalism and, and what that means for speech and, and journalism that can hold uh, governments accountable uh, across the country. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the crisis, the economic um, recession and fallout from the pandemic is going to accelerate um, uh, changes in the structure of media and and so some a lot of speech that were already underway. So uh, the big get bigger, uh, the big platforms on the West Coast consolidate and survive, have greater control, greater influence over what speech um, reaches audiences. Yes, they may be under regulatory pressure to um, to take more responsibility, but as we were discussing before, taking more responsibility is almost certain to marginalize uh, speech. Um, and in journalism, um, you see the accelerating collapse of commercially based local newspapers all across the country. And uh, this was happening anyway, and now it is accelerating. And um, while there are important and necessary uh, responses to the loss of local news reporting out of these newsrooms in the nonprofit sector, particularly. Um, the scale of reporting that these green shoots uh, are providing to their communities um, with philanthropic support just don't have the scale uh, to replace what's being lost. And um, I, th I think that is. Um, I think that is a profound, uh, a profound danger to the to the informed democracy that um, uh, our, you know our founders had in mind when they privileged speech in the first place. Um, they also had in mind comp competition of, of ideas, but the First Amendment has evolved in the complex age of industrialization and in the and in the atomic age to uh, in parallel with the rise of science to try to privilege a fact-based public discourse and without locally rooted uh, journalistic institutions to play a role in that system. Um, I think a lot of those communities are, are, are really going to um, lose something important. Um, and, and one of the things they're going to lose is just the accountability of their public officials uh, and, and their leaders. Um, you know, I think a lot of, as an example of the Indianapolis Star, which, uh, you know, essentially played a role in bringing to justice the serial child molester Larry Nasser. And when he was sentenced, the judge said, you know, if it weren't for the Indianapolis Star, we wouldn't be here today. And you look at that paper, it's it's being crushed by the same forces that are crushing a lot of independent newspapers. They still, or, or commercial local newspapers, they, they still have a strong newsroom, comes to work every day. But you think about the people who picked up the phone to call the star when they had run out of options with the prosecutors and the court systems and everything else. I mean, journalism still functions as a court of last resort. We know our public institutions fail. They fail again and again, prosecutors, you know, they do lots of things well, and then they, they miss uh, or they reflect political or other institutional biases and problems. And we can't afford to learn to lose journalism as a court of last resort. I, you know, in DC, there's all this talk all the time about whistleblower protection and whistleblower mechanisms. So just look at the way the whistleblower system has worked over the last two or three years. Do you think that absent independent journalism to create transparency around what was actually happening to the whistleblowers and who was doing what, that the whistleblower system would have lasted even a month. And so we have robust 
watchdog functions in Washington and New York and San Francisco to an extent. But in these uh, towns and cities, uh, you know, about a decade ago, I was at some, when I was at New America, I went to a hearing about the future of journalism that David Simon, the creator of The Wire, appeared at, the former Baltimore Sun reporter. And I remember he said to the, to the assembled senators during the hearing, so I laughed, but I didn't think the senators laughed. He said, you should be, you should be really happy about, about being a senator at this time, because with the collapse of local journalism, you are, you are living in the golden age of public corruption. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and that's, I mean, that's more true 10 years later than it was. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, <clears throat> that's well. But we, uh, let's end on fake news. So we have a question about, um, essentially we have a question about fake news in France and a case, but, the, but also, let's see, uh, Jen Daskal, who is a, a con law professor here at American University and our, our partner on this project, one of our, our intellectual Sherpas uh, that we're collaborating with, um, she asks, uh, she writes, curious to turn the question regarding fake news inward. When the President of the United States talks about fake news, referring to clearly accurate stories, what does it do to the state of journalism in the United States and to our democracy? We often, uh, we live in a world of such divergent narratives, including regarding baseline factual issues that we can no longer seem to have a nas one national conversation. Um, that's, uh, should we be concerned and I mean, I would add on, is this something that you feel uh, journalism schools can uh, try to remedy uh, in some way? But uh, these divergent net narratives, I think is, is, a, <clears throat> is a good way to think about what, what we're seeing just, and it just seems to be ex accelerating or like widening the chasm between the two. Uh, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, when the president does what she accurately describes him doing several times uh, a week, if not several times a day, uh, he is executing a populist political strategy that that seeks to um, motivate his base and which has the effect of exacerbating polarization uh, in the country that uh, extends you know, well beyond uh, people's attitudes towards professional journalists and to virtually every other uh, cultural touchstone that we that we're divided about these days, more divided than ever. Um, and polarization is a big subject that has much more to do um, and has to do with many more things than journalism. But within journalism, um, I, one way that I think about it, uh, and it is damaging, and can a journalism school do anything about it? Um, we are a, a school that's been around for more than 100 years. We were founded on the idea that there should be a profession of journalism, not just a bunch of ambulance chasers taking photographs of dead bodies and selling them in tabloids, and that the purpose of the profession would be to advance the goal of an informed citizenry. And essentially, it was a very far-sighted idea of why there should be journalism education. And it was uh, linked to the rise of professions like medicine and law and eventually accounting and, and, and the rise of the scientific method, which was also uh, happening at that time, in, in, in at least in an incubating way. And so what we think of as journalism today at our school is uh, lashed to the scientific method and it has a public function and it is, it seeks to justify its privilege in the constitution by working honestly and independently and in toward the goal of an informed readership. Um, and we recognize that opinion journalism and ideological journalism has always been a part of the picture in the United States. So that's not going away, but the polar, and, and it has never gone away, but the, the uh, polarization that you see in our political competition around the legitimacy of journalism is partly about economic change and the incentives that are emerging in the media business for publishers to basically pitch their journalism to their tribes. So uh, the collapse of advertising has meant, for example, that the New York Times, as it emerges as a survivor from the collapse of newspapers, um, is 
percent dependent on subscriptions and rising. Now, I don't know how many of you subscribe to the New York Times seven days a week, but it's up to like $90 a month. I'm happy to pay it uh, for the hard copy version. Maybe I, I need a discount. Um, but uh, when people are paying uh, and when publishers are driving their content toward the deepening of subscription and subscriber engagement, there is an inevitable um, clustering of of identity and worldviews that I think challenges some of the post-war assumptions about fact-based scientific method and journalism. Same thing happens on cable, more obviously. Yeah. Why do Fox News and MSNBC and CNN cluster around ideological audiences? It's because the incentives of the way they get paid by cable systems encourage them to have passionate, engaged audiences. In a 500-channel universe, if you're being carried on Comcast, which is in secular decline, but not in danger of going away tomorrow, uh, or if you're being carried on Google TV, you, uh, YouTube TV, uh, you have to justify why the carrier wants your, must have your, uh, your channel rather than National Geo 3 or any number of other thousand channels. And what Fox News discovered was that even if you have terrible demographics, like the average age of a Fox News viewer is well north of 60. And, you know, and, and you know, and you, so you're really useless to advertisers, except for a very specialized uh, section of them. Nonetheless, Fox News is indispensable to cable providers, because if they tried to pull it, uh, you know, their headquarters would be burned down. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, everybody is incented economically to get their tribe fired up and that's happening around news. Now, you know, some of these uh, stations don't even pretend to do reporting anymore. They're just like radio talk shows. But right. where it gets very confusing for, for viewers, I'm sure, is where they mix in like the idea that we're field reporters. We're going to tell you what happened yesterday. And then they have these panels full of people who, who just are basically trying to reinforce the tribal code of that of, by reference to today's headlines. And so, you know, these are huge structural forces that are in, uh, very difficult to reverse. Um, and, and yet, uh, you know, I have a conviction, we have a conviction on our faculty that, uh, that doing journalism the old fashioned way from, the, from, the, from uh, the facts backward and challenging your own assumptions and following the scientific method, telling stories, thinking broadly about what should be included in journalism that this will, uh, just as Camus said, uh, when he was thinking about this under mm. extreme pressure, you know, it will win out over time, but it's, it's a harder time to have faith in it than it was. Great, well, Steve, we're up on the hour. So uh, this, this last uh, note about where the incentives lie uh, could be another two hour conversation, but um, it, is, it is five o'clock. Uh, where we are. So I, I can't thank you enough for this conversation. It's been a lot yeah. of fun. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. We'll all go read Camus to, to, to try to find some hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's an oxymoron. But uh, anyway, I still recommend it. Okay. All right. Bye. Good seeing you. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.